Hello and welcome everybody to the Middle East 101 lecture series. I am, my name is Amin Lutfi and I will be the host for the talk today. And it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, our speaker, our esteemed speaker for the day, Ms. Rana Kardashe Haddad. Ms. Rana Kardashe Haddad has over 25 years of experience in the field of international investing and finance. She is currently the regional international regional industry director, manufacturing agribusiness and services for Asia Pacific with the International Finance Corporation, where she leads a team of 115 professionals across 16 regional offices in East Asia, South Asia, and the Pacific. As IFC, she has driven the sustainability agenda in Asia across the real sec real estate sectors through innovate and other sectors through innovative products and platforms, including IFC's first blue loan and groundbreaking green loans, as well as spearheading IFC's 2 billion real sector COVID response facility. Before taking on the role as the regional industry director at IFC, she was the country manager leading IFC's operation here in Singapore itself. Mr. Ms. Kardashe Haddad holds an MBA and MA International Economics from George Washington University and a BA in Economics and French from the University of Michigan. So thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about uh, a, a topic that connects to some of the themes that we've been thinking about in, at, in the 101 lectures, um, specifically about the economic development and this recent move towards post oil economies and the Gulf states plan for diversification of their econ economy going into the future. So thank you for joining us today. I will leave the floor to you. But before I do that, I just want to remind our guests that at the end of the talk, we would have a question answer session. So if you have any questions, please just send it to MEI events team and they will forward it to me and then I would ask our speaker for today. So thank you so much for joining us today and I would hand it over to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, and it's, it's, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, and I don't blame you for having challenges pronouncing my last name. It's not an easy one. <laughs> uh, just for the benefit of the audience, it's pronounced Karachi, which is, again, a very complicated last name. Uh, and I always enjoy listening to people try to see how best they can do with it. <laughs> but having said that, it's really, um, <coughs> excuse me, great to be here. Um, you know, as Anine said, I'm, I'm part of the International Finance Corporation. Let me give you a little bit of context of what we do, which will help frame the discussion that uh, I, I will be giving. And then I will be uh, turning on uh, the presentation in just one second. We uh, are part of the World Bank Group, uh, and we focus on investing in emerging markets, but strictly at the pri with the private sector. So what we look at as we invest, as we look at economic development, um, is the growth and how we can support the private sector because the, we really believe that that is um, a, an important engine of economic development. Without it, uh, you won't have um, you know, proper, resilient, and sustained economic development. So the private sector plays a really, really critical role in that. And, and when we do that, we look at what, what are um, the development impacts of everything that we do. So we look at that for every single investment that we make. Um, Turning to the Middle East, it is an important region for us, as I think many of you may know at different degrees uh, of, you know, may have different degrees of knowledge of what's been happening, but it's, I think we all know that it's been suffering through a lot of volatility from conflict uh, to, um, you know, climate change to, uh, um, and now COVID. And so uh, what I'm gonna talk to is really about economic development there, I'll give you a perspective of what's happening a lot of this, unfortunately, has been slowed down by COVID, but that's the case across the globe. And then what's happening in some of these countries to help diversify their economies to, and I would say, improve resilience. Uh, and, uh, and again, I think COVID has demonstrated uh, the need for economic resilience. So with that, let me go ahead, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and put up my presentation. Um, voila, there we go. What I have. Okay, 
So I, I can see it on screen, so I assume everybody else can. Uh, you know, uh, the organizers can just let me know if you can or can't see it, but I'm going to assume you can. Yes, yes, we, we can see it, we can see it. Excellent. Okay, super. So, uh, you know, I'll just start with just a broad context, and, and I would say that, uh, you know, many people think of the Middle East as either, you know, oil-producing countries, or they'll think of it in the lens of maybe the Israel-Palestinian conflict, but as you can see here, it's quite a diversified and heterogeneous region. Um, and you can see that the, 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 the entire region, you can see different levels of economic development, as well as different uh, sources of economic, uh, uh, of economic uh, income, uh, and um, as well as, you know, issues that they're facing. You can see the guide here, right? You know, there are some that have acute water shortage issues and others that have less so. Uh, some that are suffering from uh, conflict, others may be less so. But uh, I think this, what this does is it shows you the wide range of, uh, you know, income classifications there. Clearly, Yemen, we know that there's an ongoing, really a devastating conflict that's been happening, and more recently, Syria, uh, with the conflict there. Uh, and you can see that has um, uh, really impacted economic development of these countries. And I think another thing that's important to show here is that, uh, you know, uh, there was really uh, a stagnation in the growth of the middle class. And this becomes important as you think about economic development and as you think about diversifying economies, as you think about developing human capital, right? So the stagnant human growth, I think, is quite stunning. If you look at the data here, um, uh, for the Middle East, right? So the chart on the right, you see where it was in comparison to Latin America and the Caribbean and Eastern and Central Asia between 2011 and 2018. And you see that it's quite flat, uh, I think, for the Middle East. Uh, we should have Asia, I think maybe in a subsequent uh, round of this presentation, I'll try to introduce Asia statistics, but I would suspect if you put Asia in there, you'll see all the, also uh, an increasing uh, graph as well. And why we think this happened, I clearly, I think a lot of people here may be familiar with the, what was the Arab Spring in, in around 2010, 2011, which then had precipitated a series of conflicts which are still ongoing to this day. So I think that's a big reason for um, uh, the stagnation, but it has important consequences for future economic development, uh, as you can see. Um, uh, so moving to the next slide here, uh, again, bringing this in from another perspective, which I think is, is, is very, very important, right? Um, you know, you have high, high unemployment. And I think what is interesting here, um, not only is that the men as uh, youth unemployment rate is, is the highest you know, among regions at 25%, but if you look at the female labor force participation, right, um, it, it's, it is certainly the lowest. And I think what's interesting in this, in this chart here, you could see is the oil exporting countries, you have a much higher, um, you know, uh, you know un unemployment rate uh, and higher female unemployment rate versus the oil importers. If you see the gap, uh, you know, between certainly the un overall unemployment rate um, total for the GCC countries is lower than it is for the oil importers. Um, but the gap between uh, uh, female and total is noticeable for the GCC countries. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully, as I talk to later diversification of the economy, this will trigger more uh, um, female employment uh, participation in the labor force. And this is something that's certainly a priority for IFC and something that we try to um, uh, create initiatives to support this because I think it's, it's really critical for just overall economic development and development of, of human capital. Um, I think the, the chart on the right kind of gives you a breakdown by country, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the ratings of, of, of economic condition right? and, and what's stark is you can see, you know, good or very good versus uh, bad or very bad. Now you can see here, um, for example, on, uh, in, in Egypt, 
which was uh, uh, most uh, very bad uh, in 2011, but then improved in 2018. And I think that's as a result of some economic developments that they've put in place. Uh, but then if you look at some of the other countries, you see, look at the, the gap, um, which is quite, quite notable. notable. Um, uh, Jordan, uh, good has the sentiment of economic uh, you know, opportunities has declined between 2011 and 2018. Um, Lebanon, I think has always had a big gap. And I'm sure if you did that survey now after what's been happening in the country, I'm sure that that gap would even be uh, larger. Uh, and the same thing in Tunisia. And I think that goes back to you know, uh, what I had mentioned in the earlier slide of how we saw some economic stagnation uh, between 2011 and 2000, uh, now uh, 18, 19, 20. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, as it shows here on the right-hand side, the text says, you know, um, uh, a lot of these frustrations have, have spilled over into the streets. Uh, and you saw MENA region having 10 times more protests than the rest of the world. Um, and this can you know, lead to out-migration, um, a brain drain. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what we're seeing, right? And as a result of conflict and other reasons, you've seen massive migration outside of the region and uh, many, uh, a large number of protests because of uh, uh, you know, the sentiment that there's just not much opportunity available. And I think it's important. It's important for those countries, but I think it's important, uh, you know, I would imagine uh, it's a global issue. So, um, and, you know, again, here, uh, I show it from a, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, another another snapshot of of the economy and and how it's structured uh, and so uh, here you can see um, uh, the S state owned enterprises SOEs play a, a large role in the economy and you can see right um, uh, you know in finance in, in transportation uh, in in primary sectors right. So it, up to 30% of the employment uh, in the region is, is, uh, is provided by state-owned enterprises compared to 5% globally. And I would argue, uh, while SOEs have a very important role to play, uh, that's undeniable. And in many ways, these government agencies can be help provide what we would call public goods. But at the same time, uh, there are inefficiencies that can be that uh, come with, uh, with a large role of the state having in many of the industries and, and, and uh, economic activities. Uh, and so I think you know, we certainly, from where we sit, advocate for much more private sector participation in the economy. Um, it says here, economic value out of SOEs and then is nearly you know, 25% compared to 8% in Latin America, 15% in, in, in Africa. Um, the other important thing here that this, this slide demonstrates is informality, right? And that is, I think, an important, uh, um, uh, you know, element because I think, uh, you know, this, the, inform the informal sector um, often plays to a lot of uh, um, uh, um, small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's really, in many ways, an engine backbone of economies and SMEs. And so, what you want to do is try to formalize them, bring them into the formal economy. Uh, and I think this is going to be an important priority uh, for them in our region is to be able to, um, you know, uh, bring in, um, uh, you know, uh, this informal sector into uh, a formal sector. And we saw this happen in India with, with the advent of the GST to help formalize the economy. It does introduce a bit of a shock, but subsequently, really, really, uh, it helps. It helps attract private enterprise, it helps investments, and I would argue overall economic development for sure. So what does this also mean here um, is, uh, will lead me to you know, uh, my point here on the human capital index, which I think is very, very important. It's something that we at the World Bank uh, very much look at uh, and very much try to focus on because it's really human capital that sort of helps grow and develop an economy. And something that's, I think, uh, Singapore is very, very much known for. 
if you look at the chart on the left here, right, the human capital index, this is the World Bank's human capital index, which by the way, just to share the first time that the human capital index was launched, Singapore came in number one. And I remember at the time having the opportunity because I was the country manager at that time uh, with the World Bank president was here visiting. Uh, and we got to meet the prime minister Lee at the time and uh, um, really to congratulate them on, on coming in number one um, in, the, uh, you know, in our human capital index. And I think it's important uh, because I think this is through the development of human capital, education, healthcare, um, that you really can help long-term sustained economic development. Um, so if you look at this chart, you can see here for where they sit on, on the human capital index. And I think, honestly, it, you can see not surprising that Yemen really falls at the bottom here because of the prolonged, I think, just you know, conflict that's happened there. Uh, and it's really had an impact on the population. It's probably one of the worst, uh, you know, uh, ongoing conflict crisis, I think, globally. Um, and then you can see it kind of moving up, uh, not surprising, you know, Israel ranks high on the human capital index, Malta, Bahrain, uh, and Qatar also ranks well. Um, and then you have a big cluster in the middle, you know, you have the West Bank in Gaza, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Al Al Algeria, Iran, that kind of sit in that, that middle cluster there. Um, but I think this is something that the countries need to sort of look at um, um, when they, you know, uh, when they want to develop, sort of look at economic, uh, you know, uh, development. Uh, so, you know, what does that mean, right? Uh, so uh, the percentage of national wealth produced from human capital in a, is it's about half of the world's 35% versus the average 64%. Um, and, you know, you have low and unequal access to early childhood education, uh, gender gaps, uh, you know, for boys learning compared to, to girls, something that I've highlighted in terms of employment in the previous uh, slide. Um, the shocking here, you see nearly two thirds of children in the MENA region cannot read with proficiency and only 31% of the children receive pre-primary education. Um, so, and, and a growing health cha challenge. Um, I was just speaking uh, before this on a panel on COVID and healthcare impact. Uh, and globally, you're seeing the rise of non-communicable diseases, and, and it's no different. Uh, and so, um, uh, yet they don't have the resources to be able to properly treat. Uh, and then, of course, conflict. Conflict in Yemen. We've seen conflict uh, in Syria, uh, the, the Arab Spring in Egypt, Libya. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's translated into so many different forms in the region, which certainly... Uh, leads to erosion of, of human capital. So human capital challenges. And again, I've touched on this uh, before, uh, protracted conflicts. Uh, you see here, um, uh, and this is a timeline chart which shows you know, conflict in some of these countries. Right? As you go up, it, it certainly worsens. Iraq is on the decline, right, because of the, the conflict was in, started in, in 2003. So here you are from 2006 on to 2020, you're starting to see more stability in the country. Conflict has, has gone down. And in fact, uh, from IFC, where we sit, it, it is, um, have, has a quite a developing private sector. And, and IFC has really had a growing program in Iraq. Um, on the other hand, you see countries like Yemen, Syria, and of course, Libya with rising, um, uh, you know, conflicts. Um, and I think what you see here, right, as the narrative says below, you know, Yemen is the world's largest humanitarian crisis, and it continues to worsen. Uh, 24 million Yemen is in need of humanitarian assistance, uh, where 4.3 are forcibly displaced, and 2 million children out of school. Um, and these crises, I think, it, I would say, is not contained to just these countries. They do have spillover effects. They draw resources from neighboring countries um, and often have migration, uh, labor movements as a result. 
refugees. Many countries have to absorb a number of refugees. Syria is another case in point. Um, losses in GDP are estimated at 226 billion through 2017. That was four times Syria's GDP in 2010. And the number of, of refugees uh, that has resulted. Uh, for example, I, I saw a statistic recently that Lebanon, uh, about one third of the population are just are refugees in Lebanon. Uh, and in Jordan, two million refugees in the country. So it, and, and it creates strain in neighboring economies, um, which then lead to other sort of knock-on economic challenges. So aside from the, um, uh, you know, the conflict, you also have impact of climate. And I was attending the um, Ecosperity Summit last week, and really a lot of it was talking about sustainable investing, addressing climate change, decarbonization, uh, because we're seeing increasingly the impacts of climate uh, um, uh, impacting economic development, uh, economic um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenges uh, as well. Uh, and so um, the Middle East and the MENA region is really no, no different than that. And in fact, this was always a country that had very low um, water resources. And there's a large uh, you know, desert area in the region. And so climate impact, uh, reducing you know, um, water and elevating water scarcity has only increased. <clears throat> As the, the slide here notes, 60% of MENA's population uh, lives in areas with higher extreme water surface water stress. And reduced uh, 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 water scarcity could reduce economic output by six to fourteen percent annually by 2050. And of course, temperatures are expected to double in the region by 2050, and rainfall is expected to decrease by 40 percent. So, a lot of challenges happening in the region. And then, on top of that, food insecurity, right? Uh, and in the two conflicting countries. Uh, Yemen, you're seeing serious uh, food insecurity, almost famine-like conditions. Uh, and then of course in Syria, uh, food insecurity also we're seeing in Syria. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, you know, the UN estimates that over 12 million Syrians are food insecure, uh, an increase from 4.5 million, uh, uh, you know, uh, of 4.5 million alone in just 2020 alone. Um, and so the price of basic food is now 20 times higher than the pre-crisis average. And for those of you who may have been familiar with Syria at all, uh, it was really um, uh, quite a prolific food producer. It was known for its fruits, its vegetables, its grain. Um, I myself had been there before uh, and really <laughs> have to admit, really enjoyed the food in Syria and the fruit there is just amazing. Uh, and then for it to, you know, as a result of the, the conflict, you know, pivot to such high levels of food insecurity is quite amazing and quite, you know, something is, is, is quite concerning, I would say. Then now we add COVID, right? So COVID has impacted everything, uh, you know, uh, across the globe. Uh, it has led to manufacturing disruptions, supply chain disruptions, service disruptions, demand disruption, uh, destruction, I would almost say in some cases, and then certainly stress on healthcare as a result. Uh, and so, and what has happened is a lot of countries have really moved, uh, you know, implemented fiscal measures to help contain, to stimulate the economy, to keep it from, you know, uh, having much more severe, serious economic impact as a result of COVID. Um, and so, uh, um, and so that has had real uh, impact on healthcare systems, on, like I said, manufacturing. And in the GCC, you certainly see the impact on oil prices, right? Because of the result of that, you see that huge dip uh, in global oil demand, which has resulted in a huge drop in oil prices. And so the question then I think is, will these countries have the wherewithal to continue to diversify their economies or and slow that down, or will this precipitate uh, economic diversification? I think that one is still to be seen. I certainly have my views, and from what I've observed, from where I sit as part of IHC, 
where I see governments moving and what the needs are, uh, but this certainly creates a disruption uh, in, in economic plans and economic activity, right? And of course, the lockdowns have led to demand destruction. So you see that impact in retail, tourism. There are a lot of countries in the Middle East that do depend on tourism, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, right? And so these series of lockdowns has, has really dried up one major source uh, of, uh, of income, the Emirates, the UAE. You see a lot of tourists. It's a big tourist destination, right? So only recently they started opening up. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it has reduced labor, right? Uh, as workers became sick um, and experienced limited mobility due to social confinement measures. Uh, and so, and, and of course, going back to uh, how I described, you know, the, the slide where I mentioned the informal economy. So a lot of these people could be self-employed. Uh, and so this really um, can impact them, so, you know, severely. So you can see here also oil shock um, and employment shock uh, as a result of COVID. And some countries had resilience in place and were able to address it, and other countries much less resilient. So just moving to the next slide. Um, again, you know, not surprisingly, so showing one, the previous slide, right? Prices, uh, oil prices, uh, employment shock. We see here decline in economic you know, output. What you see, the projections, global economic output in January of 2020 versus June of 2020, this is just 2020, you see the difference, right? And then you see the current forecast, which is even lower. Um, and that's a stark difference, right? Um, so 7.4, so GDP is estimated to have contracted 5% in 2020. Um, which is 7.4 percentage points below the World Bank forecast in January 2020. That's really something, right? Um, and that's equivalent to about, as it says here, 230 billion in lost income. Uh, and MNS output in 2021 is forecast to be 7.8 percent lower than pre-COVID um, uh, expected counterfactual expected output. And as I had mentioned, a lot of the, the, the uh, people in the region, it's an informal, high level of informal labor market. Uh, and so that makes, uh, they become increasingly vulnerable to economic shocks. Um, and so, um, you know, while the region did not have extreme poverty uh, before the pandemic it was relatively low, um, but that trend certainly is increasing primarily due to the conflicts in Yemen and Syria. So you can see these slides here, sharp increase in poverty, um, where it was pre-COVID, uh, and then, um, you know, uh, where it is now, uh, you know, current, uh, current uh, uh, baseline estimates. So economic shocks, oil shocks, labor shocks, informality, um, um, and then, you know, sharp decline in economic uh, output. So, um, you know, and so as I've mentioned earlier, many countries we've seen that across the board from Singapore to India to the US, uh, you know, uh, public financing trying to help uh, stabilize the economy. And I think uh, the, the Middle East region is, uh, you know, is no different. A lot of countries were, uh, you know, undergoing a number uh, of different measures to help stabilize the economy here. And I think here what you can see is um, you know uh, a depiction of you know levels of government debt as well as government expenditures. So on the left hand here you see the fiscal space, right? Changes in real government revenue and expenditures in 2020. It's all a decline uh, for the most part, right? You have a, a decline uh, in uh, um, uh, you know uh, revenues and grants, right? So a decline. Um, and expenditures, you know, uh, also, uh, you know, were uh, declined as well because there just wasn't enough economic space as well. Um, developing oil uh, importers actually increased, right? Their, their, uh, their, their uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, expenditures. But the income, what was coming in, I think what's important to this slide on the left hand, it's the revenues and grants certainly declined. Um, and then the expenditures also declined, but by a lesser extent. So what that means is that the scope for fiscal support has been limited uh, in oil exporters, um, primarily due to the collapse of oil prices. Uh, and then in some importers because of the high government debt. The chart on the right, what that tells you is public debt. Uh, that grew uh, in, in several, uh, several of the uh, MENA countries, right? Uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, in previous decades, um, you know, uh, the decline in global oil prices negatively impacted both oil exporters and oil importers uh, through FDI remittances, grant and export channels. Uh, and so COVID-19 has led to a further material weakening uh, of public finances. Uh, with a, you know, a large increase in, in fiscal deficits across the MENA region. And that's led to a surge in public debt of nearly 10% uh, of GDP in some of the countries. I think what the chart on the right hand uh, you know, uh, shows, which is I think interesting, if you look at the world, right? So if you look on the, you know, for example, on, on the right, right? Public debt in 2019 and, and 2020, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the high, high income uh, uh, MENA region uh, had lower percentage of GDP as public debt. Um, and, but, uh, um, uh, you know, the middle income oil importers had a much higher percentage of public debt than the global average, right? So, um, so clearly they did not have the resources um, to be able to uh, help uh, with some of the economic stimulus measures that they needed and therefore had to assume additional public debt. Uh, whereas maybe the, the Gulf, the, the, um, uh, you know, the higher income countries had a little bit more and those were generally the Gulf countries, the oil producing countries had more wherewithal um, and did not have to assume as much, uh, um, uh, as much debt. But nonetheless, it, you, know, you, can see, you can see how that transition between different countries, uh, depending on their economic development. So uh, for this, this one, and, and going back to what we do at IFC, we're really looking at development and economic development and economic impact. And we look at that through the lens of um, the SDGs, right? Uh, and so, you know, what has COVID done as a result? And we see this, it, it has a compounding effect uh, on many of the SDGs, right? So first, you know, three, good health and well-being. As I mentioned before, health systems are facing significant strains. Um, I've mentioned Yemen and, and in Syria where, um, you know, uh, I think the, the healthcare system is, feels really, really strained. Uh, and of course, in Lebanon here, as I mentioned, I think I had read uh, the statistics that it was about one third of the population of refugees. So 73% of the Syrian refugees reported reducing their food consumption uh, in, in, uh, in, in Lebanon. So that's a, that's a notable impact. Quality education, uh, pre-COVID, pre um, MENA was already experiencing a learning crisis over half of the 10 year olds in lower and middle income countries could not read with proficiency, uh, significantly undermining lifelong lear learning. Um, and so school closures have only exacerbated this challenge. Um, and so uh, I think it's uh, something that, uh, you know, I think is gonna be important. And I think countries will have to certainly focus and double down their efforts on education. Uh, gender equality. Uh, you know, many women in the region had lower status position and were underrecognized with limited legal protection, protection uh, that put them at great, greater risk during such time as the pandemic, uh, you know, so which it, we saw there's an increase and we see that we saw this globally, uh, risk of gender-based violence has increased, not just in the Middle East, we've seen that all over globally. Um, and so, you know, uh, as a result, they've lost, you know, limited their voice and agencies, right? and as well as ultimately participating in the, in the labor market. And then, of course, as I had mentioned in previous slide, 
you know, uh, a sharp reduction in economic output in the region, right? Something that the region was already struggling to create jobs. And I mentioned the stagnant middle class uh, in, the, in the region. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, SDG 16, peace, justice, and, and, and uh, institutions, right? So um, uh, there was, you know, perception of, of, you know, corrupt and lack of transparency something that you see in a lot of emerging mar markets, uh, but I think the, the here this word we see FCV, which is fragile and con conflict um, uh, and violence uh, countries, uh, violent facing countries. Um, uh, um, that's, uh, so you're seeing some of that in, in the region and I had shown a chart about that, right? So I think that also perpetuates that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the image of, of ongoing violence in the region, right? Uh, so you see these institutions uh, can be impacted by that. So what needs to, what needs to happen, right? Um, so I think as a result, and these, you know, now I wanna talk about some of the, you know, okay, so now what and what's happening? So we are seeing some positive movement there and some, some movement to address the development challenges in the region. And the World Bank is very much part of this and, and IFC is very, very active here. But in, in matter of fact, for us, it's very much a priority region for us. Um, and so uh, trying to see how we can help, how we can help stimulate economic activity, how we can stimulate development, how we can support the private sector, right? So in, in many of these ways, in many of these areas, it requires investment, but also structural transformation. So what would I say about that, right? So you have to, you know, um, look at uh, um, uh, how you can build back trust in governments, and in some cases, we're seeing that happen. And actually, we see that vary from country to country. Uh, in some countries, you do see a higher level of trust in governments. In Jordan, for example, you do see that. Um, in other countries, you see much lower trust in government. I think case in point here is Lebanon, right? I think many people here may be familiar with the crisis. Has happened the political crisis and of course the the physical crisis, which was the explosion at the port in Beirut, which led to economic and physical devastation as well. And then subsequently the political crisis uh, and of course the financial you know stress that the country is facing as a result of the the, the stress on the banking sector. Um, so this you know I think you know one structural area that will need to be addressed. And I and I I am you know here in a, uh, you know sort of perennial optimist. I do believe. Uh, that once a crisis hits, um, unless there are severe externalities, you will start to see movements to addressing these crises. And I, I do believe that the countries will start to look at addressing these from a structural uh, perspective. Um, and so I, once they, they deal with the, the, any ongoing conflict that they're seeing, right? The other thing is returns on human capital, right? I, I'd mentioned, you know, learning poverty, learning losses, right? Uh, weaker health system. So, uh, you know, and this is a priority area for us, right? So investing in education, tertiary education, um, and investing in healthcare. And so we're seeing a lot of movement now towards trying to address these problems. So again, sort of looking at the issue and trying to address it. Uh, uncompetitive economies. I think there is globally, from where I sit globally, a, a very, very active dialogue on bringing and increasing the role of the private sector in economies uh, because the fiscal space, the inefficiencies of some of the SOEs, um, it, you know, uh, really were highlighted through COVID. And so now we're seeing an openness. So we're seeing movements and discussions towards privatization towards bringing in private capital, towards bringing in private investments into countries. So again, starting to see that dialogue shift, certainly. Gender gaps, right? As I mentioned, that, that needs to certainly be addressed. And we're seeing a lot of initiatives towards supporting women in the workplace uh, in the MENA region. Now, migration, now this is a much more complicated story, right? Uh, and I think only once you put in place structural changes you eliminate and you mitigate the conflicts that are, uh, you know, appearing in some of the countries that you can reverse some of these, uh, you know, uh, um, forced migration trends. I mean, I, many of us, I mean, some of us know a lot of people, you know, in Syria, like I said, I've been to that country. I know a lot of Syrians and, you know, I can tell you, you, 
the vast majority of them would like to return to their country. Uh, and so, you know, once it's back on a path of stability and, uh, you know, conflict uh, is, can, we can say is, is, you know, been mitigated or re significantly reduced, you will see many of them uh, returning back to Syria, right? Um, but in the meantime, they do present structural challenges to the countries that are hosting them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this has impacted Europe, the US, uh, and certainly other parts of the Middle East as well. So I think, you know, um, uh, uh, you know hopefully, you know, managing and, and mitigating and reducing the conflicts, you can see, you have to start to hopefully re 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 reverse some of this trend. Climate is, I think, a different situation. I think climate is a global imperative. It's a multilateral imperative. It's a country imperative, and it's an individual imperative. And I think this is something, as I said, I was part of a discussion last week in talking about the importance and the impact of climate change. And I think the Middle East is no, no uh, different. Asia, we're seeing the impact of climate change through flooding, uh, through um, uh, you know, uh, disruptions, um, in uh, and extreme weather patterns that are happening, I think, in Asia, um, you're all, in the Middle East is, is no different. So here, there you're seeing higher rates of accelerated desert desertification, uh, groundwater depletion, um, and also a large share population and, and flood prone coastal zone, which is, I think, you know, you see the two different ends of the impact of climate. And that can also lead to growing uh, migration, not just climate, but also um, uh, uh, conflict, but also uh, migration as well, uh, climate. And so, um, so you're seeing here that, um, you know, that's something that we have to address, I think, on a global scale uh, and, uh, you, know, um, you know, on a global scale. And so, um, uh, and, and I think this is something, as I was saying earlier, something that we have to address uh, collectively, it's an important, it's an important, important initiative. And, you know, the, the World Bank is certainly prioritizing climate as an agenda for us, for example, uh, we are looking to grow our, our um, climate investment footprint, we have committed to that, you know, 35% by 2030, of our investments will all be climate related. And then here, you see, uh, again, uh, with the result of COVID, just kind of gives you a depiction of, of where the evolution of the vaccine might be. Um, uh, you can just, I think it's just a kind of an interesting, you know, picture which shows you, you know, you have Russian, you know, African Union vaccine supply, COVAX, Sinopharm, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna, right, all, uh, you know, uh, being used to varying degrees. Um, by uh, the countries uh, in the Middle East, right? As you can see, what this chart on the le left uh, denotes is, you know, a secure doses of COVID-19 vaccine, uh, you know, uh, with one or more approvals, right? So Egypt, this is in millions, 141 million doses. Algeria, 33 million. Libya, four. Uh, Djibouti, only one million. West Bank and Gaza with three million. And Yemen, uh, 16 million. And so you see going down, uh, going down the list here, um, various degrees, Iraq 19 and, um, and all, like I said, from various different so sources. And the chart here on the right tells you, um, you know, the rollout schedules, right? The early starters, late arrivers, and the lagging, the ones lagging behind. And I think, I don't think it's surprising to see Sudan, Syria, Yemen as lagging behind. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, but uh, the ones that started earlier, I think also not surprising, Israel, we all know Israel's had a very, very successful vaccination campaign, uh, but then also the wealthier countries, right? The UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, uh, all started very, very early with the vaccine uh, procurement. Uh, and then you have those that were in the middle, you know, uh, Algeria, Jordan, Lebanon, Tunisia, the West Bank and Gaza. So it's moving up. Uh, it's it's improving there, and that kind of tells me, gives you a sense of okay, you know these were, you know here's the profile of the region. Here's what's happened in economic development. Here are some of the challenges that they're facing, 
and the economic impact as a result. And then when you overlay COVID, right, you add even much more challenges and complexities to there. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that we have seen as a result of COVID is the countries really taking a, a concerted effort to say, okay, what I, the reforms that I needed to put in place beforehand become increasingly important now uh, because we see what we need to do is improve economic resilience develop human capital, diversify the economy, uh, ensure our supply chains in there, and help the provision of healthcare. So we start to see some, some uh, you know, movement and activities towards addressing some of these concerns. What I will do now is move to the GCC countries and talk a little bit about diversification efforts, right here. So, um, uh, you know, as this title says here, you know, uh, the, the Gulf countries were hit by the print shocks of the COVID. Uh, and of course that impacted weakened uh, global oil demand in 2020. Uh, and so they went into a contraction as a result uh, and that necessitated the general support to the private sector, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, trying to, you know, challenging the service-based, uh, you know, successful diversification model. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, this first bullet here talks about private sector and SME support measures. So the one thing that I think it's important to note here is, again, and I reference SMEs, SMEs play a very, very important role in the economy. They play an important role in, in the economy in Singapore. They play an important role in the economy in the U.S. Massive employers, but also tend to be less regulated and sometimes informal, right? And so... Um, and so the ability to support, and they're the ones that were often vulnerable through as a result of COVID because they're smaller companies, not so diversified. They don't necessarily hold a lot of cash in their balance sheet. They don't have access to large credit lines. And so when there was a disruption as a result of COVID, SME sector was really hit. Many countries were able to provide fiscal and, and financial support either through the lines or moratoriums, mandatory moratoriums on the banks in terms of you know, repayment of the debt or some other kind of uh, stimulatory, uh, stimulating, uh, uh, stimulus measures. Um, and so uh, to help uh, as a result. Um, uh, and so you know, here are a few things that, uh, that these countries have done, right? So for example, Saudi Arabia provided uh, to the private sector, you know, including postponements of taxes and zakat payments uh, estimated at about 32, uh, 32 billion. And the government also pledged uh, to help businesses struggling with wage payments to Saudi Arabian employees with government compensating 60% of employees' salaries. Um, the Saudi Human Resource Development Fund announced an allocation of about 500, half a billion to support 100,000 uh, job seekers in the private sector. In addition, uh, to offering active, activating remote work tools, um, you know, as available and alternate options for regular work. Um, and so, uh, you know, so a lot of these measures were granted at aiming SMEs, um, you know, six month deferrals on bank payments, concessional financing and exemptions from other costs uh, of a, from a loan guarantee program. So, uh, you know, this was a lot of the, you know, activities in there to help support these SMEs. As I mentioned earlier, SMEs do play an important role in economic diversification, right? It's not one large oil company. It's not a large natural gas company. It's these SMEs that are the sort of, uh, you know, employers for a lot of the youth, maybe women as well. So these efforts to continue to support these SMEs really were part and parcel of, of I think, the, the government's support, not just for economic activity, but economic diversification. Um, the UAE, uh, you know, announced a 27.2 billion stimulus to facilitate, um, you know, uh, temporary relief on private sector loans and promoted SME lending. Um, the Qatar, uh, Qatar Central Bank uh, encouraged banks to postpone uh, loan installments and, and obligations of the private sector with a grace period of six months. Um, you know, Oman uh, deferred loan installments and interest charges for businesses, particularly SMEs. Uh, and, you know, uh, Bahrain provided wage subsidies uh, to private sector employees. So all movements to help, uh, you know, improve economic diversification or, or maintain uh, some level of economic diversification and resilience. 
So, um, so, but what had been happening, so that that's, you know, the SME supporting measures, and that was a lot driven by the need as a result of COVID. But, you know, there, there's also some structural reforms that had been put, being put in place. Um, as this, the second part of the slide notice, noted, you know, to, uh, you know, as part of the new um, labor strategy, Saudi Arabia amended its, uh, its you know, uh, kafala system to give expatriate workers um, greater uh, job mobility, right? So um, to help create some, uh, you know, uh, some ability for people to move between jobs. Um, the UAE introduced reforms allowing the full ownership for full foreign ownership of onshore companies uh, and annulling the requirement that commercial enterprises have a major Emirati shareholder. I think that's significant because what does that do? It brings in much more private investment, much more capital, again, helping to introduce diversification and economic uh, resilience. Um, same thing, Qatar also made reforms to its system allowing migrant workers uh, to change jobs, similar without uh, you know, employer's permission. Uh, and Kuwait had helped to improve the business environment by approving new competition law and, uh, uh, and new, uh, new bankruptcy law. If I go, so this kind of tells you some of the activities of what they were doing to help you know, offset the economic impact of COVID as well as you know, push towards more diversification of, of their economies. The next slide is kind of gives you a snapshot of sort of you know, uh, economic for, forecast, right? So if you look here, I think it just kind of shows you, right? Um, you know, Saudi Arabia's growth forecast, you look at what had happened uh, in 2020, sharp decline, right? Bahrain, sharp decline, UAE, uh, sharp decline, Kuwait, sharp decline, right? All across the board, a sharp economic decline. I just think that that's an interesting snapshot. It, it, I had mentioned this earlier, right? They, when I showed the sort of the, the, the regional macro picture in terms of economic decline, but I think what this does, it just kind of gives you a nice sort of country by country, right? You can see, um, you know, uh, there was positive economic growth to varying degrees, uh, and then a sharp decline uh, in, uh, um, uh, in 2020, and then, you know, uh, you know, sort of improvement. This is something that we're seeing across the, uh, across the globe, certainly. Um, but, um, um, uh, but you can see here, uh, you know, the impact uh, on a lot of these oil producing countries. And as I said, a lot of this was also driven by the sharp decline in oil prices. So I just thought that was given sort of a nice pictorial visual. This next slide here, and I just have a few more slides to go and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, uh, the next slide here, just also gives you some of, uh, from another angle, the fiscal uh, and response me measures, right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the stimulus measures that were put in here, sort of monetary and fiscal responses, right? Um, in terms of, you know, fiscal response, uh, change in policy rates um, and policy measures as a percent of, of GDP. And as you can see, most of which has been sort of monetary and macro fiscal measures versus fiscal measures in many of these countries. Uh, and you can see here, right, um, <clears throat> what has happened. So fiscal stimulus packages, uh, they've typically included, you know, higher spending on healthcare, uh, relaxation of tax obligations, particularly for employers, uh, and increased spending on social safety nets uh, to support incomes among the rapidly rising numbers of unemployed uh, worldwide and in those countries, right? Uh, monetary and financial measures, uh, you know, have included lowering policy interest rates, something that we've seen across the, uh, across the globe. Um, relaxation of macro prudential rules, again, no different. We see that uh, everywhere. Uh, micro prudential guidance, such as encouraging banks to accept delays and, and interest payments on outstanding loans. Again, something that we're seeing everywhere else, the, the, the region was no different, and liquidity support. Um, but the sum of fiscal and monetary and macro financial measures made in, in response to the economic downturn actually were quite sizable. Although tilted more towards monetary macro support um, uh, more heavily. So in Bahrain, for instance, the measures added up to 37% uh, of uh, close to 37% of, of GDP. 
um, and Qatar, uh, although the fiscal support was 0.4% of, of GDP, um, the overall package nearly 14%. Uh, percent. Uh, and Oman and Kuwait, where the authorities did not quantify the fiscal and monetary measures respectively, the available figures don't fully reflect the, the, the scope that we think of the policies taken. And I, I think this next slide is also worth sharing because I think we've seen that and we see that here in Singapore, right? Stringency index. Uh, and you can see the up and down of the stringency index. And I think here in Singapore, we certainly felt it, right? Relax you know, uh, uh, more strict, a little bit relaxed, more strict. And I think it just shows you the, the challenges of managing this that governments have under COVID. Um, and I think here it just shows you sort of where um, a lot of these countries are in terms of, you know, the stringency index. And I think uh, the one that has remained, right, uh, relatively low, if you look here, Bahrain looks like a little, little bit lower, but most of these, you know, again, and this was a, you know, the 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 time, I guess, of the, the second was the, the second wave, March uh, of of 2021. Stringency index, uh, you know, uh, went uh, you know uh, went up, and of course, you know, um, uh, you know, so uh, and I and I and I think you know you'll see, and it's I think probably if you look now, it's probably relaxed a bit more. Uh, but I think what is interesting here is that you know it, it, in this. You see up and down and up and down, right? And I think the challenges, and I just think this is just an interesting uh, graph. It doesn't really talk about economic development, but I think it's just interesting to observe um, this slide. Um, and here, I think on the right, you see the number of COVID-19 cases uh, per million uh, population, right? So, um, um, uh, and I think that's just an interesting, uh, you know, uh, you know, cases, uh, thousands, um, January through April. April, which is the dark uh, green cases in thousands, January to December 20 um, in, uh, in light green, uh, and then, you know, thousands, you know, per million population. Uh, and that's just proportionate. One is absolute and then one is a, is a proportion. Uh, and I think, you know, I think this, this graph shows you that it's just, it, it varied from certainly country to country. Um, but here you can see the UAE, for example, cases uh, January to December 2020 <coughs> versus January to April 2021, almost equal, uh, but yet very different for some of the other, other countries. Um, and I just think that's just an interesting uh, slide to uh, graph to, to observe. So if I go, you know, to this next slide, and I think this one also, um, you know, uh, is a very, very interesting slide because we talk about um, oil related, uh, oil contribution to growth versus non-oil contribution to growth. And what this slide will tell you is the level of success in diversifying away from oil seen in many of these Gulf countries, right? So if we start, for example, you know, with, with Saudi Arabia, right? Um, Non-oil contribution uh, to GDP versus oil contribution to GDP, non being the green, uh, the pink being the oil contribution there. You can see in 2015, we had a fairly sizable amount declined notably in 2016 uh, and in 2017 as well. And then picked up again in, in 2018 and then 2019, you saw a decline in oil contribution, but an increase in non-oil contribution in the portion 2020 will crop. Where this will go, I think we don't know, uh, but certainly the country is looking to diversify its economy. Next to it, on the other hand, you have UAE, which is a completely different picture, right? So non-oil contribution, much higher. Uh, than oil contribution. I think they don't have as the oil resources they have in UAE is not as much as in Saudi Arabia, so that's normal. But I still think it's it's interesting. It's an interesting chart to look at. Uh, and then you have you know uh, uh, Qatar as well. Uh, you see the difference. Um, I think what is uh, also interesting, as you can see, is, is Bahrain, for example. You know, very very little in terms of oil contribution to wealth. Mostly you know non-oil contribution to growth. Um, and I think Oman somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think Kuwait also is quite an interesting, uh, interesting chart because you could see um, 
2015, 2016, uh, you know, what has happened, I guess, in Saudi Arabia is more accentuated in Kuwait, um, particularly in 2017, right? Decline in oil prices um, and the contribution to non-oil uh, to growth, uh, you know, uh, that gap notably different. Uh, but then you go to 2020 uh, and certainly um, the oil, uh, you know, uh, non-oil contribution to growth really uh, significantly smaller. So it's still a journey, I think, for many of them. But I think it's something that is certainly a, um, a priority for many of them. Um, and this, I think, presents it yet from another uh, another angle, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, so in terms of exports, right? So it not only entails diversifying production structure as income rise, but also extends to diversifying export product baskets and markets, right? So non-hydrocarbon exports, right? And and this is. In way, what was reflected in the previous slide, you can see here, uh, right? You know, Bahrain has a much higher level of non-hydrocarbon exports, um, UAE, uh, and then it goes, you know, uh, down in terms of Qatar and, and Kuwait being the, the lowest, right? So, you know, all GCC countries have have increased their types of products and and, and numbers in the markets, um, while the UAE is, is shows here has made the most progress in increasing non-hydrocarbon exports and percentage in terms of percentage of DDP, you know, Bahrain and Oman have made similar advances, maybe to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know uh, as well of that. I think this may be, you know, uh, the uh, last slide here. So uh, this just kind of goes, you know, um, uh, expected growth in GDP going forward, right? Um, so the growth in the GCC will restart the expectation. Um, the World Bank is expecting to restart moderately in 2021 before picking up to an average of about 3.3% in 2021 to 2023. Um, still reliant on hydrocarbon output exports and revenues uh, despite diversification efforts. Um, but, and so we, we do expect that they'll benefit uh, from the recovery in oil demand and oil prices. Um, uh, but uh, so certainly they will benefit from the recovery of those prices and hopefully the move towards the, uh, diversification will be ongoing. Um, but it's also this recovery is expected to be as the, here on the right hand side, you know, driven by private consumption um, as well and fixed in invest investments. Um, uh, so, and you know, um, uh, you know, the, the resumption oil and gas projects, we will probably see some of those uh, as well. Um, but, uh, um, you know, uh, but we do expect some growth to, to continue. And I think what you can see here, right, the, the expectation, the forecast of private consumption, right, and it varies from country to country, um, you know, uh, fixed investment, uh, public consumption, and then net exports as well. So it's pretty, I would say, relatively um, mix between the three uh, across all countries to, to uh, varying degrees, um, which, uh, you know, I think, like I said, um, you know, uh, it's, it's one indication and I think a very interesting snapshot in terms of where we see, um, you know, GDP growth uh, going forward, right? But I think it's, you know, going to be a mix. And I think it's important that we do see projections of increase in private consumption, uh, because I think that's a big, big driver of economic the growth. The fixed investment expectation will probably still continue to be in, in, in hydrocarbon, but I think um, as these countries move in towards diversifying their economies, um, it will help, I think, uh, sort of for economic resilience going forward. I think this is, and with that, I think that is my last slide. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, what I'll do is I'll maybe just stop sharing here. Um, and then just go, you know, to, to the full screen. And, and I think what I was trying to, to share here was to say, okay, there are a lot of challenges, uh, giving you some economic statistics in terms of how the region operates, the difference, the heterogeneous, uh, hetero, how heterogeneous the region is, what COVID has impacted and how that's impacted economic development and what's important for them to, to continue to achieve their SDG goals. And some of the, you know, sort of, changes that we're starting to see as a result. And then talked a little bit about the GCC economy is the impact um, that uh, the COVID has had as a result of the oil price decline, 
um, and their move towards diversifying the economy base and then finalized with some statistics and some, uh, you know, to show you sort of how, um, you know, uh, from different angles, the GDP growth has looked um, in terms of composition, in terms of right across uh, across uh, the, the Gulf countries. So with that, I will stop and say thank you for allowing me to present and see if there's anybody uh, happy to take some questions, Q&A. Thank you so much for the very detailed talk. Uh, I mean, it, it puts a lot of the data on the table and it'd be interesting to like get into some of those charts maybe even during the discussion. Um, so I'd just like to remind everyone, if anybody has a question, you are welcome to send it to the MEA events team and they would forward it to me and I can then read it to our presenter. Um, we will start with, I mean, we have a question in from Alex and Alex is suggesting, he's saying, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. You mentioned the MENA region, welfare dynamics, especially uh, changes associated with middle-class status. What are the immediate impact of COVID-19 on human capital development? Also looking at the necessity to use digital tools that are currently not being used, uh, properly diffused in the region. In your opinion, in the coming five years in the MENA region, which countries will accelerate the trend for non-poor populations falling into poverty? I mean, it's it's a it's a series of questions. We can we can maybe yeah. Um, so we can so maybe you can cut maybe give me the first part of that question. Then I think it moved into adoption of digital technologies. But can you, if you can repeat the yes, first part of the yes, question? Yes, yes, yes. We can maybe maybe we can start with with the question of of like uh, the middle class status. This question we said that there's a stagnation. Um, across the Middle East in, in the growth of, of the middle class? I mean, what do you think are the main uh, causes behind the stagnation? And are there any um, sort of more hopeful uh, indications on the horizons of hopeful developments on the horizons? Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I, I tried to touch on it and maybe I went through it a little bit quickly. I think, you know, if you look at the stagnation, because the, the, the Middle East had a a fairly good, you know, trajectory before 2011 in terms of rising middle class. And, and just as a point of reference, I used to cover the Middle East region when I was, before I moved to Singapore, I was, uh, you know, investing in the petrochemical sector and I was, you know, looking to focus primarily on the Middle East. So I was, I was doing, and I was seeing a real growth trend in terms of investments into different uh, uh, parts of the economy, including health and education. Um, and I, I think if you ask me sort of what helped, what, what really precipitated sort of that, that stagnation uh, mm -hmm. in, in the middle class, it really, uh, if you look at the timeline, right, between 2011 and 2018, this in the chart, you had the, what was the Arab Spring in 2011 at that point in time. And I think from that, you saw a series of political, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, turbulence. Uh, in there, what started in Egypt, then to, to Libya, um, and of course, well, it started in, in Tunisia, right? Uh, you know, then to Egypt, uh, and then uh, we saw it in Libya, um, and then, uh, you know, the conflict in Syria and the ongoing uh, uh, conflict in Yemen. And so what has happened as a result of that, you had huge sort of what economic displacement, migration, as well. So in the countries that were facing these conflicts, economic stagnation, certainly as this was, you know, kind of resolving the situation politically on the ground, also, you know, significant migration, which put pressure on neighboring countries that really did not necessarily have, a, a, you know, conflict that were erupting, but had to absorb all of these migrants. That also creates economic displacement, not just for the migrants themselves, but can also in the local economy, you see a lot of will take jobs from a lot of the locals. And that creates sort of political, we saw the, the unrest and the protests in the region. And I think if you ask me, so I think that was a large contributor to that stagnation, the middle class. And then, you know, government, uh, you know, uh, funds, which are limited, right? so in these countries had to go to dealing with some of these immediate issues versus continuing to invest in the health and education and human capital. So I think a lot of this sort of perpetuated itself. Now, you know, 10 years into that and post COVID, um, we're seeing a lot of sort of re-engagement by governments to try to help stimulate private sector development, private investment and investing in human capital. Um, and so, um, 
you know, uh, for, for example, I think for us, we're seeing Egypt really, really booming in terms of economic development and investment. So I think that conversation is shifting and we're starting to see more of a focus towards bringing in, uh, you know, uh, the right kind of private investment, investing in human capital, um, investing in healthcare, investing in education. So we're starting to see that shift. It'll take a few years to materialize, um, but I think um, uh, you know we're starting to see some positive discussions in those areas. If I could just add on to that question, you mentioned uh, Egypt as one of the one one example of a country where we're seeing positive growth. Are there any other examples or any? And what do you see perhaps? Um, as which countries might we see um, some uh, sort of you know positive development in terms of the human development index or even in their ability for poverty uh, alleviation are there any specific countries that you would like to perhaps like point out at this stage so I, you know I think it, it's 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 a, it's a different stage in different countries but let me just highlight a few others so Jordan um, actually I think they manage if you look at that country has a a number of uh, con uh, conflicts surrounding it, right? So they have Iraq on one side, uh, the West Bank and Gaza on the other, you had uh, Syria. Uh, and so they've managed, I think, uh, uh, navigated that very, very well politically. Uh, and so they've, uh, you know, kept, um, and, and uh, if we look at I ISC, uh, actually now in retrospect, I should have had what our portfolio look like in the region. So you get a sense of how much we've invested. But Jordan, we actually invest quite a bit there. Um, so I think, and Morocco, I think also is another country that has very good sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, has been doing relatively well. Now then I pivot to the GCC countries, right? So those countries, they have natural resources, they have hydrocarbons, they were already pretty fairly well developed. And I think um, what we've been seeing, uh, you know, my husband's actually in the field of education. Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, what he's seen as a lot of push in the GCC countries to help develop human capital, to help, you know, Im improve um, you know, in, in which sectors the locals are employed and sort and, and to educate and to help sort of, you know, uh, bring them into the workforce at, at many different places, many different levels. So I think, you know, there you're going to probably see some, uh, you know, uh, continued improvement there. Um, and, uh, you know, you're seeing, for example, Dubai, they're trying to create sort of a health hub there. So, um, and that's something that they've been pushing for. So I think if we segregate the, the Gulf, I'm I'm fairly confident that they're going to see, you know, continued sort of now they're going to be on the upward trajectory economic growth. And, I, and I'm, I'm quite sure governments will continue on that path towards, uh, you know, diversification of their economies. Um, if I could, you know, just to continue the discussion, I mean, you in the end sort of mentioned about segregating the Gulf states from some of the other um, uh, Middle Eastern state. I'm, I'm wondering, like, even uh, more broadly in terms of seeing the data, are we now at a stage where perhaps it might be more beneficial to see a disaggregated data between, let's say, the, you know, the, the Gulf states where you have, um, you know, with hydrocarbon resources and sort of, you know, more uh, very different circumstances, or very different sort of concerns and points in development, whereas you have another uh, sort of, um, you know, Middle East which perhaps, you know, more in broad strokes has similar, is facing similar circumstances or facing similar threats. Is it beneficial to think of, think of these as sort of like two discrete parts or two discrete sort of um, components of the Middle East? Well, okay, so I can tell you how we do it, right? So we, we only invest in, in emerging markets. We don't invest in the Gulf countries because they don't need IFC support, right? I think uh, their GDP per capita is much, uh, higher. We do in some select areas, very, very, it's highly, highly selective because it has to be something that is really developmental. So we do actually segregate our intervention. So we invest in Jordan, um, Iraq, uh, you know, Egypt, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, either Lebanon, um, and Morocco. We don't uh, invest as much in the Gulf countries. Like I said, we do some, but it's very, very selective. So for example, water maybe, because it's, it's a, you know, uh, an important, um, uh, you know, it's a scarce resource all across the Gulf. So we might help in some areas of introducing private capital, private investment in the water sector. Um, but, uh, but in those countries, so we actually already do, uh, you know, segregate that. Um, I combined them in this presentation, uh, partly because, um, 
to show, because in, in many ways, I mean, these countries, they are different economies and they all kind of op operate you know, sort of with different dynamics. But because migration and because a lot of uh, people from uh, the, the poor regions go into the Gulf to work, what happens economically in the Middle East region, some have, can have a direct and indirect effect in the Gulf countries. So you always have to be mindful of what's happening in the rest of the region because they play an important role in terms of, you know, they provide a lot of, you know, funding support. Um, there's, you know, trade that happens between and a lot of employment between these countries. So that I'll often show the whole picture uh, because in one way, shape or another, they, they do affect each other. But in terms of how we invest, we certainly segregate them, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. And I'm also wondering, um, since one of it seems that one of the main um, uh, one of the main one of the main um, uh, uh, sort of challenges facing the Middle East is continued conflict, be it in Syria or be it in Yemen or you know like Iraq and even parts of Lebanon and so on. Um, what is uh, the World Bank position on investing in countries with ongoing conflict? Is are, are it, is we do. Uh, you invest in during in the midst of in the midst of conflict. We of course we have to provide support. We so we we segregate countries from middle income to lower middle income to Ida Ida, which is are the poor countries. But then I mentioned FCB, which is you know uh, you know uh, you know fragile and conflict uh, and violence affected states. Uh, and those you know we really do try and help. It's not easy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's not an easy thing to do. And we do try to set, you know, sort of our you know, internal targets of trying to, to, to support some of these countries. So we absolutely, we do, uh, we do help. Uh, you know, I, it, it, right now I cover, I don't cover the Middle East region, but I was covering Asia and part of Asia was Afghanistan. So we were certainly looking to invest in, in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, now the situation has changed a bit for, but for many years we were uh, supported, we we're supporting the agri sector. We were looking at healthcare and education there. So we certainly do, but it's not easy, as you can imagine. It really isn't. You really, and we just did an investment in the agri sector in Yemen, uh, I think uh, last year. So with a company, so it, it's, you got to find for us when we invest, right? We're investing in the private sector and, and you don't want to put money into something that you think is not going to be sustainable or survive. So you have to be, it's, it's not easy finding, but, but it exists and we do actually put capital in those countries. What I don't know, I don't have off the top of my head is if whether we've done anything in, in so I know Yemen, um, I don't have data if we've done anything in Syria recently. So I don't have the most recent data that we put in, but I think as a matter of principle, we do still invest in, in fragile and conflict affected uh, countries. No, thank you, thank you for the response. Um, if I could just uh, shift the conversation towards the Gulf um, for a bit, um, you you sort of highlighted some of the more the broader structural changes taking place right now, in terms of uh, uh, pivoting some of these Gulf economies perhaps away from oil or perhaps or sort of diversifying their economic base at least. Um, what do you see as the main drivers behind? this pivot? Is it simply sort of this fear of oil money running out or is, it, is there a broader agenda that you see behind it? So. I, hmm, you know, I think that's a good question. I think um, this is something that I think had been on the agenda for some time, right? And, and it happens in spurts and, and stalls, right? right? Uh, and, um, but uh, I, I think, even when I was covering the Middle East, there was a realization by many of these countries that you know you cannot survive just in the long term, just based on oil revenues. It, it, it helps significantly, right? And if you look at the GDP per capita, wealth, education, there's a notable difference. So I think that it's great. And, and in many cases, these countries have done better than other uh, oil uh, producing countries, other you know hydrocarbon rich countries, I think. Uh, you see, they've relatively they've managed conflict, um, uh, you know, and so uh, the disparity of income is not as great in some other countries as well. So in that sense, I think they've done a fairly decent job, and I think a lot of these, you know, sort of, uh, uh, 
governments and leaders realize that you need to, for economic resilience, right? So you have one oil shock, you have a second, you realize you need to have a diversified uh, economic base. Um, and so that's just been happening. And I think it's just natural. It doesn't happen maybe as, the, as, as fast as the pace that everybody would like, but it's certainly moving in that direction. And one thing that I, what we've noticed certainly across the board is the impact of COVID has brought to fore whatever economic needs or imperatives or structural reforms that were needed in place certainly were highlighted as a result of COVID. So if you ask me, I think it, many governments will move, I can't predict fully, but many governments will, I suspect, will move towards uh, you know, uh, implementing you know, these kinds of reforms certainly going forward. What would you say, um, or how do you foresee the the graph i mean the i mean i'm here basically thinking about one of the last uh, graphs that you showed um mm -hmm. that had a, i don't know if you could put it on but, but that the gdp to oil ratio and the, the the shape of the curve was interesting i think you discussed it for for very briefly too um that it, would you it like was, me to put it back up uh yeah i mean it's it's a, it's a more broader point too but i think i think if, if we could have it up if it, it'll be helpful um but I was interested that the, the curve of it was was uh, far from. Yes, yes, exactly this one. So, mm -hmm. so there's 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 you know there's ups and downs. It's it's far from you know the uh, uh, mm -hmm. one direction. Would you say, given this past, that this is perhaps how we might best expect the the diversification or shift to continue, where you have sort of moments where. The shift towards greater diversification, then there's there's fallbacks, then there's you know further progress. So rather than imagining a clear uh, linear line, perhaps this is this is what diversification might look like. I think if you ask me my opinion, of course nobody has a crystal ball, but yes, I would expect it to be you know uneven. I don't think you'll see it. You may see over a longer period some kind of a trend, but I think year on year you're going to see volatility, um, and it'll change you know year on year for sure. Um, it, I think it's, yeah, I, I, if you ask me, that's kind of, I would expect to see, you know, this as a shifting pattern uh, going forward. Uh, thank you. We also have a question in from the audience. Uh, Asif is asking, could you please elaborate on IFC's foray into the domain of blue loan and its future mm -hmm. prospects? Ah, okay. Well, that's not, uh, that's Asia. That's something our team did, uh, which was, uh, you know, was IFC's first blue loan. So that is, you know, this, it's an initiative to combat marine plastics. Uh, and that's a, you know, uh, I'll be actually speaking at the World Ocean Summit in November on this, uh, on what we're trying to do. So we've been working with the World Bank to get an assessment of, you know, how, how can we help to address this? Uh, and so in this case, what we did was we worked with Indorama Ventures, um, which is a large producer of PET bottles, and they made a commitment to increase, and I don't have the figure off the top of my head because I wasn't expecting the question. I don't have it off the top of my head, but increase significantly the number of, of uh, uh, the recycling uh, of, of bottles uh, as part of their um, manufacturing process. And so we were able to, uh, you know, IFCs issued a number of green loans and, and issued green bonds. And so we just worked internally with our um, uh, you know, uh, with our, um, uh, you know, internal climate team and to create the taxonomy, the, the framework and the certification for this, which would be a subset of the green loan to make it a blue loan, but specific. So that was kind of the process we had to go through. So, you know, how do we tag it? How do we certify? Can we assure that this would be blue? We went through that process, but ultimately it is the objective is to sort of reduce, um, uh, you know, uh, limit to mitigate marine plastics. And this one was directly contributing to that. The World Bank has provided a number of studies in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, I think Malaysia as well, in terms of uh, diagnostic of what they need to do to put in place and how to reduce uh, marine plastics. It's, it's a major issue across Asia. Uh, thank you. We have another question um, and it, it's, it's about um, COVID-19 and digitalization, like how far, how has COVID-19 impacted the digitalization yeah. of the economies in across the Middle East, perhaps? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because I was just speaking at a healthcare summit, and let me see if I can pull up my statistics there, because I think this, uh, um, this you know, has come up because what we're seeing is, you know, so digitization has, has grown significantly uh, as a result 
of COVID because of lockdowns, we can't move on, we're all working remotely. Um, and so that's certainly increased. And I've got here uh, statistics. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, so one, we're seeing governments are, you know, introducing regulation to enable technology treatment of COVID-19 remote prescription. We're seeing an openness to that. Um, uh, and um, uh, where is it here? Uh, so just in healthcare, just, uh, so I think across the board, it will be, but let me give you uh, statistics with healthcare because I was just talking to that. So here, so, you know, we're seeing now patients are now more willing to use digital healthcare instead of visiting uh, healthcare professionals in person. So a Bain survey uh, revealed that 50% of patients in Asia and Pacific say they expect to use digital health tools in the next five years. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's just, it's just, it's going to go up. You see sort of the online markets, Amazon, things like that taking off. Our investments in, in things like data centers have really gone up because that's all about the digital economy. No question COVID has accelerated that. It's had accelerated that in digital learning. It's accelerated that in digital healthcare. It's accelerated that in the digital marketplace. Um, and so uh, I think uh, for sure, for sure, it's, it's, it's here to say. And, I, and to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know how much this will go back. I think the digital marketplace is certainly here to stay. And I think in terms of now people realizing that they can do doctors virtually, I actually like it, you know, I, I don't mind it. So I, I think I think that's certainly gonna accelerate. What's gonna happen now is that governments need to think about on the regulatory side, what are the implications? What are their data privacy laws look like? Do they have, uh, what are the standards look like in countries? So that it, it'll grow, but that introduces a whole nother suite of questions for regulators and for governments to look at um, and, and uh, you know, to address. So it's complex. It's complicated, certainly. Thank you. If I could also just ask you about, you know, climate change, um, how seriously are any kind of efforts being made in across across the Middle East in addressing some of the challenges presented by um, by 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 the sort of the climate catastrophe, let's say. So, you know, we're seeing every country, for us, climate is an, is an imperative uh, and we're doubling down on our efforts in climate and the Middle East region is no different. I think everybody is taking it seriously, to be honest, I mean, I, mean, I think all countries are. In, in the Middle East, the issue is desertification and water resources, and it's really important there. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it is a constant, uh, you know, struggle and it's a serious issue. Um, and, uh, you know, you're looking at new technologies to, to help address this. Um, but, uh, but I think, yeah, they're really looking at it seriously. I, we, we've invested in a lot in the renewable energy space in Jordan and in Egypt uh, as well. Uh, and um, uh, I think, uh, you, know, um, you know, I don't have the all the policies off the top of my head, but I, I you know, we know that this is an important, uh, a, it's an important concern for them for sure. And I think we, we would expect climate related investments to only increase in the region. What about the Gulf states, like given their sort of dependence on oil, um, is, there, is there sort of, you know, positive development or any sort of indication of um, them also like taking climate change seriously as well? I think every country is, or every, every conversation with every country that we have, I, I cannot say I've encountered one country which that does not take it seriously. The question is, how do they implement it? Mm -hmm. And what does, and a lot of these countries are committed to sort of net zero, but what does that transition look like? And I think for the Gulf countries, because of the strong level of the hydrocarbon base in there, it'll, you know, it's going to be an interesting path. Um, I don't have those, those discussions and those policies, but, you know, each country is going to have to look at what's that transition for them um, and what does it look like? Uh, and so uh, I think it's, it's, I, from what we understand, we talk to them, it's, it's very much important. Um, but I, but, you know, we're not going to expect them to turn the tap off from one day to the other, right? So it's, it's, I, I, it'll just be a different kind of path uh, than, say, Singapore, for example. Okay. Uh, I think we're about uh, out of time. 
Um, so thank you so much for this wonderful presentation today. I'm sure all our audience have greatly benefited from this very deep analysis into the economic and political situation in the Middle East. So thank you everyone for joining in as well. Please do uh, stay tuned to MEI events more broadly and the 101 series in general, in specific. So again, thank you to our speaker today. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you to all. All right. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.